Hey guys, Floyd here with Curbside to Bedside. Today we're going to talk about the care of a patient with an acute stroke. And what kind of spurred this topic was uh, a few weeks ago, somebody posed a question on a uh, popular EMS uh, Facebook group, how we should uh, triage stroke patients and where we should transport them to. And to be quite honest, I'm not a smart enough guy to really answer this question. So Ryan and I decided we would reach out and get an actual neurologist to come on the show um, and help us answer some of these more difficult questions. So we brought on Dr. Ben Newman from Baptist Health Lexington. Dr. Newman, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for answering our cold call. Yeah. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Good to be here, guys. Um, so should we refer to you as a neurosurgeon? Yeah, so I, um, I'm a, a completed residency training in neurosurgery, uh, University of California in San Diego in 2012. Uh, that's a seven year residency. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, seven years. Uh, fortunately, I was able to, uh, do what's called an infolded fellowship. So during my seven year training, I went to, uh, the Barrow Institute in Phoenix. Uh, which is uh, a, a really um, renowned uh, training program. And I was, I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship position there in what's called endovascular neurosurgery. And that uh, allows me to do minimally invasive treatments for things like brain aneurysms and AVMs. And so rather than doing craniotomies and kind of opening the skull, which is part of the traditional neurosurgery training, uh, we learned minimally invasive techniques. And okay. part of that was – a stroke thrombectomy. And, um, and so that's now as a dual trained endovascular and neurosurgeon, uh, part of my job and part of my interest is helping to, you know, develop uh, stroke care. And so that's, that's kind of what I do. So I spend most of my time at the hospital as a, as a neurosurgeon. So I, you know, take care of patients with necks and backs and do all that kind of stuff that most neurosurgeons do. And then in addition to that, I also, uh, cover the, the acute stroke program at Baptist with two of my partners, uh, Dr. Christian Ramsey. He's also a dual trained neurosurgeon and then uh, Curtis Given, who's a radiologist. So there's three, okay. three treatment pathways, three training pathways to get in to be a stroke doctor. You can be a neurologist, a radiologist, or a neurosurgeon. I'm sitting Excellent. here really worried about my posture right now. It's terrible. <laughs> so I'm just throwing it to the wind. It'll fix me in 20 years when EMS finally kills my back. There you go. Because you have a lot of pretty cool extracurriculars, right? I, I think that that, yeah, that neurosurgeons as a group tend to be uh, kind of eccentric. I don't know. Um, I, I can't imagine why with a seven-year residence. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've got to find different things to do, I guess. Um, yeah. I think I... Uh, Mostly what I do when I'm not in the hospital is I'm a, as I'm a husband and a dad. I got two small kids. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my work done at the hospital so I can, you know, get home. And I really enjoy being uh, a family guy with my, yeah. with my kids and all that stuff. Uh, but I sort of got involved in, uh, weightlifting, uh, Olympic weightlifting to be specific. And so I've been doing that for about three years. And that's kind of how I, that's how, kind of how I try and stay in shape. And you know, I, I try and make time a couple of days a week to go to the gym and, and stay up on that stuff. But it's just been a really fun sport to kind of stay strong and flexible and healthy. And I really don't like breathing hard. <laughs> so I, I shy away from the sports where you have to like run or I love playing basketball, but you know, I'm, I'm not like a lot of my colleagues and partners like to go out and ride bikes and jog and run and things like that. And I just You're not doing those crazy 100 mile ultra marathons where you just run for 24 hours straight. Absolutely not. <laughs> not a chance. That's okay. They're masochists anyway. <laughs> I think the question we're really trying to answer is what the hell do we do with stroke patients? Because I'm, I'm getting the feeling that nobody really knows. And we have a lot of people reaching out to all of our uh, EMS agencies that we work for saying, bring them to us. And we'll give lytics and send them to the mothership or bring them to us and we'll do thrombectomy. And I think that's just a very, a, a grand oversimplification of strokes. And I think there's a lot more to it. And that's kind of why you're here to tell us what we should do with those types of patients. Maybe not to bear that mantle of responsibility, but there's like, as Floyd said, there's kind of a clamor. <clears throat> because we have certain facilities saying you need to bring them here so they can get early lytics 
and then we'll send them on for thrombectomy if they're candidates. Or, hey, bring them to our facility, just bypass the other one. We can do either or here. So they can take all comers. So if they're not a thrombectomy candidate, they can get Lytics on board. And if they can't do either, they're a tertiary referral stroke center so they can do the rehab and they have the neurologist there so they can go to the floor and be managed that way. So there's a lot of confusion and a lot of mixed messages because there's, there's a, a large presence of multiple hospitals at our door basically trying to pull us in one way or another. Yeah, it's it's a mess. I mean, really, I, I think we, there's a lot of stuff to unpack kind of in everything that you just said, and hopefully we'll we'll get to all of it. But I'll, I'll first of all, I'll just start by saying that we've already made a huge it's a, it's a huge step in the right direction that we're even having this conversation because up until you know um, the 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 90s when TPA became a treatment option for patients with ischemic stroke. There really wasn't anything to be done. So if there's any of the you know EMS paramedics that are listening that were working back in the 80s and 90s, stroke was just kind of this thing where you took them to whatever hospital and they would get parked on the floor and uh, probably end up in a in a nursing home. And again, as you guys know, stroke is the you know number one or number two leading cause of uh, death and disability in the United States it's a huge problem especially here in Kentucky you know we're in the stroke belt as they say oh yes <laughs> and uh, so it's 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 a huge problem and it's something that we need to get better at overall and so to kind of to kind of get back to your point you know the fact that EMS providers and paramedics and first responders are now even thinking about this problem as stroke as something that's treatable and and, and it's now more closely approximated to what you would do for a STEMI, you know, now it's like, oh, I got a stroke patient here. We need to get this patient to the appropriate care facility immediately with the time as brain mantra and so forth. So now what do we do? How do we, how do we tease that apart? And so I think we only have an hour, hour and a half or something like that, but there's a lot to go into with that. So, you know, I, one of the things that I do also, in addition to kind of, you know, my practice as a, as a clinical neurosurgeon and stroke doctor is I sit on the KBEMS uh, subcommittee for stroke and cardiac care. And so we're working with EMS systems throughout the state to try and standardize and give recommendations with regard to exactly the questions that you're asking. What, what, what is a, what is an EMS provider in Georgetown supposed to do with a stroke? What versus what somebody mm -hmm. in Pike County yeah. is supposed to do? So that's, that, that's kind of point number one. Um, when you talk about, uh, specific, uh, rules and algorithms, it, it's extremely dependent on geography. So for example, you've got ambulances in Houston where it's a very dense, very, very populated metropolitan area. You might have, four stroke centers within a geographical area of 10 square miles. There, that's a real problem. What's the EMS? What, what are you supposed to do as an EMS provider? If you've got somebody with a suspected large vessel occlusion, that's also a model where they've got ambulances with CT scanners on board now. So they're starting to give thrombolytics in the ambulance. They'll put, they'll put them in the, they'll put them in the bus, scan their head. Clinically, they suspect stroke, no evidence of intracranial hemorrhage, none of these stroke mimics, a brain tumor, whatever. They're, they're going to give TPA. And so that's a very different model than an EMS provider in far eastern Kentucky who's three hours, maybe four hours, depending on the weather, from any sort of stroke center. Those, the, you can, you're not going to be able to come up with an algorithm where it's one size fits all and you're going to be able to satisfy all comers. So I think- when we're coming up with guidelines for the state of Kentucky and the providers here, you really have to sort of specify, are we talking about in Fayette County? Are we talking about within Fayette County adjacent? Or are we talking about, you know, rural Kentucky where the travel time is a lot more? I think what we're trying to parse out is a, a general approach. So you look at other well-developed systems of care, like cardiovascular, like so a STEMI. We know... And a large byproduct is because this has been studied, which is not necessarily the case as much in LVO strokes. For example, if you have a patient that has a STEMI, there is probably benefit to stopping at a facility and giving them lytics and then heading on to a PCI if you're greater than two hours away from a PCI-capable center. And it's the same thing with our trauma system. If you have a critically ill trauma patient and you're a large distance between you and a level one, it may be worthwhile to stop at a level two, three center and get stabilizing things like blood or chest tubes or definitive airway management on board with that patient before proceeding on. 
And that's an approach for where Floyd and I work. It's generally better for us to just go ahead and go to the definitive care because we're relatively close. But that's us. That's not everyone else. But it's kind of getting a handle on what kind of approach should we start looking at? And we don't necessarily need definitive timelines, more just where do we go? Because that's it's kind of the unanswered question is no one really knows. It hasn't been well studied in the literature for as it pertains to us. And the guidelines, as you as you outlined, are kind of hard to pin down because of the wild geographic differences that we're contending with. Are you going by ground? Are you going by air? Are you four hours? Or are you four minutes away from a CT scanner and a neurosurgeon? Those are all extremely important factors, but no one even really knows what our general approach should be. So you brought up STEMI, and I think this is kind of something that I wanted to get into anyway. I think it's neat that we we can compare the system of care to a STEMI system of care and try to implement something similar. But I think they're a little different. I don't think that we really have all the, the answers yet because we know basically how far past a how, – how far we should drive past a facility that can give lytics before you get a um, – before the benefit of – Giving the lytics outweighs the that done by driving to that the of a that of PCI. So I think it it depends on basically where the inf- infarct is in the heart. You know, it may be an hour and a half, it may be two hours, but basically we know that with when it comes to heart muscle, um, you have quite a while. Uh, you have a longer period of time to intervene. Is that the same with stroke? Yeah, gr- those are great, great points. So I'll just circle back to your original question, which I think dovetails a little bit with your conversation. So from an EMS provider's standpoint, what is a reasonable amount of time to prolong transfer if it means you're going to get to a comprehensive stroke center or this new joint commission accreditation of a thrombectomy capable uh, center. So basically, can you go someplace that's going to be able to give you the the wide variety of ischemic stroke uh, treatments? And the I would say that right now, again, this is the, the the specific number is something that was sort of actively being debated within our community, but it's probably on the order of twenty to thirty minutes. If you're going to have to prolong treatment, certainly if if you're an hour away, if you have to drive past a primary stroke center to get to a comprehensive stroke center and it's going to mean an hour on the ambulance, then you should stop. You should stop and get that patient stabilized. You should get them lytics. You should get them a head CT and, and uh, you know, adopt more of a drip and ship uh, uh, approach. And, and I want to come back to that in just a second too. So right now, uh, and again, we're sort of finalizing the language that we give out to EMS providers. But I think the last uh, cardiovascular subcommittee meeting that I was at for KB EMS was, I think, 30 minutes was the was the sort of cutoff. If you think it's going to be more than 30 minutes, you just go to the closest center and get the patient stabilized. And I, I would like to revisit that because there are some some challenges that we've observed in, in our own practices with these centers. And it, it may be a virtue of a lack of experience on their behalf or the system not being essentially standardized. Well, well, absolutely. And I mean, I think also the other thing that I hope we get a chance to touch on a little bit is that right now, stroke care is a lot less about deciding what the best treatment is and whether or not TPA is harmful, beneficial or thrombectomy or this and that, but it's um, identifying triaging and uh, sort of sorting out our workflow and developing stroke networks that can provide access to these things for for multiple different people. So part of me wants to look at it and and attribute a lot of this to growing pains because we've seen a monumental advance in how we can care for stroke patients in the past 20 years. I would say in the last year, the last two (laughs) years, it's changed. I mean, we can talk about the Dawn trial, but I mean, we're this whole like last known well that is sort of the gold standard is the thing that we pin a lot of our stroke treatment decisions on is last known well. You know, we're, we're, we're moving away from needing to rely on that sort of vague and potentially, you know, uh, problematic uh, piece of the history and moving more towards objective physiological imaging that helps us triage. So we're seeing a lot of paradigms as kind of getting, 
either completely thrown out or upseated from their 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 throne of former glory. Definitely. And and I mean I think you're also running into, you know, to get back to your other point, not all primary stroke centers, not all community hospitals that claim to be able to take care of strokes, they're not all created equally. Mm-hmm. And that probably has a lot to do with the fact that if you've got and I'm not trying to pick on neurologists or ER physicians because I think taking care of acute care stroke patients is really difficult and it's really challenging. But if you haven't kept up with the evolving medical literature in the last five years, you're not gonna you're not gonna know what the best thing to do is, and you're not gonna be able to provide the best care and for it's patients. So voluminous the amount of literature that's just being churned out to kind of sort the signal from the noise versus what do I really need to because I have that kind of EM mindset. All of this is important, but some of it's probably more important than others. How do I need a triage? Like, what's the most high yield out of this? Because there's even just anecdotally just trying to pin through and read some of the literature. Floyd's a much better researcher than I am. Just being like, there is a lot of material here. What is going to be the most high yield? Yeah. Yeah. And trying to parse that out is is its own challenge. I think, I think, I think that again, that's part of, you know, my role in interacting with KBEMS is trying to figure out how, how, how do we, how do we, uh, pair those recommendations down, make them evidence based, make them useful, but then also provide tools that you're actually going to be able to use. And so, um, you know, talk about pre hospital stroke scale in field assessment tools. You know, again, the fact that we're even talking about <laughs> that stuff and starting to implement it is a huge, is, is a huge step in the right direction. And I'm like, it's absolutely growing pains for sure. We just don't know enough about this because five years ago, uh, we weren't even really sure that thrombectomy worked. Yeah. And, and now it is the standard of care. We've got eight randomized controlled trials showing, showing that thrombectomy works. A new trial showing that you don't even really care about last known well. You can throw that right out the right. window. If you've got a favorable you know, physiological imaging, which typically is CT perfusion, if you've got a favorable profile on CT perfusion, we'll offer thrombectomy in those patients up to 24 hours. And it's been shown to have demonstrable clinical benefit. And I've seen that in my own practice, bringing a patient to a comprehensive stroke center and watching them do the CTP and then getting a picture of, this is the clot we pulled out of this patient's head because yeah. they were a viable thrombectomy candidate. That's right. We kind of ventured into the um, the uh, thrombolytic um, discussion area. And I just have a few things that I want to mention. If I don't know if you're responsible or responsible for the state uh, stroke triage algorithm or not. I think it's very confusing. I, I've been responsible. <laughs> low for, key shade there. <laughs> that's fine. I get it. No, no, no. That would happen before I got there. I'm okay. trying to fix it. No, no. It, that that we you know that that is a work in progress. I understand. And, and we're and we're we're trying to simplify it. The problem is is that every time we meet to talk about fixing something that was proposed at the last time, there's been some new right piece of data, and so. So now we spend all our time. There was, I mean, the last three meetings I've been to have been talking about, well, which pre-hospital stroke uh, assessment tool should we be using? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because there's problems with each of them. It, it, right. Exactly. And, and, and fundamentally, it's a thresholding problem, right? Yep. It's like at some point, you've got to make it simple enough so that people are going to be able to use it. But if you make it too simple, then you're going to get a ton of false positives. And that's kind of where we are right now is that, you know, I think Cincinnati is the one, the Cincinnati scale is being used in a lot of EMS providers throughout the state of Kentucky. And um, I'm fine with it, even though the false positive rate is very, very high with that scale. It's only three questions, right? But it works and it, it, it allows patients to get recognized that have large vessel occlusions. Are we going to have to probably tune that in a few years and maybe find one that's a little bit better so that we're not wasting healthcare resources and taking patients that have Bell's palsy yeah. to, you know, uh, uh, Baptist to get their, th- you know, thrombectomy? Yeah, I, I think definitely that is uh, the problem. But for right now, I think everybody's in agreement like, hey, we would rather cast our net too wide and catch some people and maybe have a few transfers that we didn't need if that means that we catch another, you know, five thrombectomy patients yeah. that we wouldn't have caught otherwise. I mean, that's, like, that's worth it to me. Like even with the, it. the trauma centers have a have a built-in over triage rate. Yeah, right. That is just – and, and our, our STEMI systems of care also expect a baseline amount of – over triage signal in their in their metrics. That's uh, true with everything. I yeah. thought your analogy of uh, stroke to STEMI was interesting to talk about because 
you're right. There are some important uh, dissimilarities, but to me, there's a lot more similarities with STEMI and trauma to stroke than there are, you know, not. And mm-hmm. and, and the reason for that is, is in order to have a really good um, comprehensive stroke center, it, you've got to mobilize a tremendous amount of people and resources. There's a lot of infrastructure that a hospital has to build into place in order to get a stroke center up and running so that we can do you know, thrombectomies 24-7, 365 with 30-minute access times. And we have all these things that we track. I've got to have EMS. I've got to have ER physicians. I've got to have good radiologists. I've got to have good pharmacy techs, radiology, nursing, ICU. All these things have to be in place and ready to go in order for us to do that in the same way that you have to have that for a level one trauma center, in the same way that you have to have that for a STEMI center. The difference is that physiologically, stroke is very different than those other processes because we don't have uh, an EKG for the brain yet. Yeah. We don't have a troponin for the brain yet. I think we will get those things. But right now, we base a lot of our stuff on a pretty messy, dirty, clinical sort of so it's, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis until you can get them in the donut. Right. And, and am, I, am I right in saying that <laughs> patients with LVO can present with a fairly low NIH? Absolutely. From super low to as high as it goes. Absolutely. And I, this, is, this, is one of, this, this is another area that I think you're going to start to see change within the next 12 months. Maybe, maybe not that, you know, I don't know, year or two. Um, but one thing, and again, not to sort of pump ourselves up or anything. The Baptist has been at the forefront of a lot of these innovations. And we've we've bet correctly on a lot of, you know, we bet correctly on thrombectomy uh, five years ago. We bet correctly on CT perfusion two to three years ago. So we've had all these technologies in place. And fortunately, our administration has been kind of backing us and we've we've proven to be correct in a lot of these things. And a lot of these trials are bearing out the practices that we've adopted even in the last couple of years. So to, to your point, We'll often see a patient that comes in with an acute MCA occlusion. They're, you know, let's say they're 83, um, acute MCA occlusion, and they come in fluctuating symptoms or NI stroke scales of four, you know, it's not too bad. You do your physiological imaging and find out that there is a huge area of brain that is at risk of converting to completed infarction. So basically, they have a very tenuous collateral blood supply. And then you go back and look at the patient a little more carefully and you realize, oh, this is an 83-year-old with a little bit of congestive heart failure, a little bit of coronary artery disease, and she's trying to maintain a blood pressure right now of 170 because that's what she needs to drive the blood through those collaterals. If you don't take out that clot, she is going to she is going to she's going to convert it. that she's going to bone it and it's going to happen at 2 a.m. and it's going to happen right after the nurse does her assessment and then all of a sudden you you're trying to play yeah. catch up and you've got a problem. So we will take patients to the cath lab with very low NIH stroke scales if they have um, if they have CT angiogram and a CT perfusion profile that fits for a large territory at risk. Why so, is that? Because what? we because we think that we think that uh, they will um, progress to having a major stroke mm-hmm. if that's not if that okay. if that um, anatomical lesion is not addressed. So you're saying if you think not just if they have a large territory, not if they have an evolving large territory, but if you think that they might have one. Right. Or if I think, or if I'm concerned that they're not going to be able to maintain the the physiological, you know, uh, compensatory mechanism that they need to keep that brain alive. So why just large vessel? Why not? Like I had a patient mid thirties, um, took him directly to a uh, Baptist. Mm-hmm. They had uh, all to place on board within 20 minutes, mm-hmm. but he had a posterior stroke. Was not a candidate for thrombectomy, even though his NIH was super high. Uh, they did perfusion imaging immediately, of course, um, but he was not a candidate. Yeah, is it is it because it's hard to get to certain areas in the brain? Well, if you're, if we're talking about posterior circulation strokes, fortunately, those are a lot more rare. But unfor- not, not a cerebellar stroke. Okay, uh, they just said it was a posterior stroke. Uh, not a cerebellar. Well, that to me, that could mean that it was like a brainstem perforator stroke, which those are microscopic vessels. There's nothing we can do endovascularly to address that problem. Or it means that he just had, you know, when we talk about what we do when we do thrombectomies is we insert large bore catheters. Everything's done through femoral access 99% of the time. We get a big eight French catheter, park it at the skull base. 
And then we have smaller catheters that can very easily get out into um, proximal uh, branches of the middle cerebral artery. So anything that is that is too far out, mm. our devices run the risk of rupturing those those small okay. vessels. And that's another thing why stroke is so different than STEMI is the blood vessels inside the brain lack the muscular layer that they have inside the heart. So they're much more uh, friable and they're much more prone to rupturing. So you have to be a lot more gentle and careful when you're instrumenting those vessels because the risk of perforating one is a lot higher. So typically speaking, you know, you've got your internal carotid artery bifurcates, you got the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery. Um, when you get past sort of the second branching point of the middle cerebral artery, you got to be really careful because okay. you can you you can you can rupture an artery. And so if there's a clot that's distal, we'll either unfortunately have to leave that alone, or sometimes we can give intraarterial thrombolytics. Yeah. Um, despite what some people say, it works. <laughs> it is systemic or intraarterial. Both. Okay, that yeah. is a contentious debate. It and is. I will oh, say God. I will say it's not contentious amongst uh, neurologists or neurosurgeons. And I'm I'm honestly not entirely <laughs> sure of the the source of the conflict in EM as much because if you look at the people that this is their job, like neurology, it's pretty it's it's pretty consensus. Like everyone's like it works. And then you walk in, you open the door to the EM lounge, and it's just nothing but you know tables are being thrown, names yeah. are being called. I so, think I think it has a lot to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so I, you know, I, I hadn't, to be honest with you, I hadn't really paid much attention or I hadn't paid much attention. Or I wasn't aware that there was such a contentious debate amongst ER physicians and EMS because, uh, from my perspective, kind of coming up from within the stroke training paradigm, uh, there, there's really not a debate. I mean, there aren't any, you know, neurosurgeons or neurologists who debate whether or not TPA is useful or safe or should be given or anything like that. The one interesting thing that has been cool for me to see is there were a ton of neurologists who didn't believe in thrombectomy hmm. and they thought we were murdering people. And it was just this <laughs> like, you know, I remember- Well, two in, of the major trials were stopped early because it was unethical to withhold the treatment from the control group. Yeah, yeah but you got you got to remember, you got to remember prior to 2015, all we had were negative trials for thrombectomy. Yeah, the first this is few, true. The first right? few were negative. And, 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 so, and so I remember going to meetings in 2013 and 2014 and the, the endovascular neurosurgeons were getting up on stage saying- we still believe that this works and I know that the evidence doesn't back it up right now and we really need a positive trial because we're so sure that this works and we've got to get it right because if we have another negative trial, CMS is going to pull funding and you're not going to have thrombectomy anymore and we think it's going to hurt people. And there were neurologists in there and they were like, well, if I have an M1 occlusion, don't you dare go up there and take it out because this and that. And I mean, it was really like pretty ugly. And that's, then fortunately, that's how the TPA debate is in EM. <laughs> yeah, it's, it gets pretty gruesome. Yeah. So, from my perspective, and again, I don't want you know, we don't have to get too lost in the weeds and all this stuff. And I and I didn't go back and look at the NINS data on my own. I think I think there's a couple of things that come to my mind. One is is that stroke is a highly litigious field. Yes. And e Absolutely. emergency medicine is a highly litigious field. And so I think even in EMS, that's one thing I, I hate to cut you off, but it really that like there's something that really speaks to that point. And one thing we keep seeing from like some of the case law that's being handed down from EM is when is going to be our seminal legal case where an EMS provider gets sued for not transporting a patient to the appropriate facility when there exists so much question about what is the most appropriate facility to take these patients to. Yeah. We were actually told that that seminal case is happening now. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not surprised. And I mean, it, it's really, there's, there's so many things that are wrong with, um, with, with, with healthcare, you know, particularly in this environment that, you know, that that's a whole, that's a whole podcast series uh, probably. <laughs> but to get back to your original point, you know, I think that there is, there are, there are, in every field, there's skeptics and there's people who critically analyze and look at data and, and every study is flawed in some way or another. And so, yeah, you can go back and do Parsons subgroup analysis and you'll find something. Well, maybe this is actually a conclusion that could be drawn from the same data set. And, you know, there, there, there's, there's genuine controversy there. I think when you go back and look at the early uh, thrombolytic trials, 
the patients that have really bad, you know, intracranial hemorrhages and die from it, or they have, you know, we talk about the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage from systemic TPA administration. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what's the rate of that, of the systematic? And that's defined as a, you know, a, a worsening by, I forget, maybe it's five points on the NIH stroke scale or morbidity or mortality or something like that. Most of the patients who had really bad symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages were patients that had large vessel occlusions and probably had, you know, some degree of core infarction in the basal ganglia. Then they get this thrombolytic, the the blood brain barrier in that area of the dead infarcted brain is compromised. And so you get reperfusion hemorrhage and all this stuff. At our hospital at Baptist, our rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage in 2017 from systemic TPA was 2%. And we haven't had one in 2018 at all. Wow. So, so it's a safe drug. When, if you what, select the right, if patient. you, I mean, that's, right, that's yeah. medicine, right? You, you pick the appropriate intervention yeah. for the appropriate patient at the appropriate time. So, so in our hospital, you know, TPA is administered regularly. I feel like it's a safe drug. I feel like it works. I feel like you could make an argument for if you have a documented, you know, ICA or MCA occlusion with questionable sort of core. You know, hemorrhage, or uh, you know, if you've got already infarcted brain, make an argument for not giving TPA, even if they're within guidelines. That's a that's a whole separate issue. That's more I, clinical gestalt than anything, right? And so, I think um, part of the problem is is that thirty percent of patients that have an MCA occlusion will recanalize with systemic TPA. So it's not much, but you know, to get back to your point of should you stop and you know give somebody. TPA at a regional hospital before you get them to off that if they're if they're in that thirty percent that recanalize uh, and they they have a good outcome then you know it's worthwhile. You said MCA, but what out what about other large vessel anterior vessels? Yeah, I mean ICA. It's like basically I think I think the rate is zero. Okay, just, it just doesn't work on large clots. So yeah, I mean for for most big clots it's not as effective. And you said the rate of ICH is higher. In large vessel occlusion. It was in the NINS trials. When you okay. go back and look at the people that had bad intracranial hemorrhages before thrombectomy was an option and before we got really good and sophisticated about kind of screening patients, that that's my that was my sort of, you know, I'm going to research this for 10 minutes and try to educate myself a little <laughs> bit so that I, you know, because I, because I, again, I, I'm sympathetic. I think that uh, neurologists and EMS providers and ED docs are, uh, you know, you're under the gun to make a decision within a very short amount of time. And if you're worried that the drug that you're giving is dangerous and not beneficial, but on the other hand, you're going to be sued if you don't give it, Mm -hmm. you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. So, it makes sense to me that there would be a movement from within that community to say, well, hold on a second. You know, the data showing that this drug is safe and effective is flawed and maybe we shouldn't be doing it at all. There's there there's motivation there to you know to kind of protect everybody patients yeah. patients and physicians and EMS providers so I, I get it but I think it's where a lot of a lot of the the contention is sourced from I don't think any of it's malicious I think it's hold on we need to figure this out before we really start basing our guidelines that we're by hook or by crook going to live and die by in the courtroom or in the the CMS reimbursement hall my my hope is that with better uh, systems of stroke care, better um, dispersion of technology to help triage and identify patients. Some of the stuff is going to go away because nobody's talking about whether or not you should be taking patients for thrombectomy now. It's a different world than we were 10 years ago. Totally. I mean, mm-hmm. just. And I think this this question is twofold, and especially in acute care. And this, this can apply to just about anything, but especially for acute stroke or acute STEMI or trauma. But really for stroke, it's become more imminent is we have to answer two questions in in extremely quick succession. We have a clinical question of, are we screening these patients correctly? Are they having a stroke? How confident are we? And then we have a logistical question. And you really outlined it well with the hospital logistics of mobilizing an acute care stroke team and all the people that that takes. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Okay, go um, for it. And what really bothers me is when you look at the uh, get with the guidelines registry. We now have a lot of data for hospitals that are participating in that registry. I guess, is every stroke center required to submit data to that? No. 
No, <laughs> there's different. There's different. There, there, there's multiple different competing you know, shame. organizations. Uh, I think most of the stroke hospitals that I have been to are, are using get with the guidelines. It does seem to be sort of an industry standard, but um, boy, that's a whole separate <laughs> conversation. Because now that now there's a competing organization that will credential uh, comprehensive stroke centers. It's not just the Joint Commission. Oh. There's there's a, there's another. Uh, seeing, Either way, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there's still a big registry, right? Um, that that we can pull data with from, and there was uh, the article time to treatment with uh, IV TPA and outcomes from ischemic stroke. I think they looked at the registry data, and it, it showed that I think that for every 15 minute delay in the administration of a thrombolytic, the mortality or disability was worse. Um, but the thing that bothered me was the patients who got uh, all to place in within uh, 90 minutes had a very high NIH. So it's it's the patient with the obvious stroke. It's the patient who thrombolytics may not work for. And it's the patient who we should probably be, in my opinion, more focused uh, on getting to a thrombectomy center. And we talked a lot about the workflow in the hospital, et cetera. The patient that I had that I took directly to your hospital the other day, they had it on board within 20 minutes. Um, Which is excellent. That's not really going to happen at any of the other hospitals that I transport to. And this is also evidenced by our difficulty in getting reliable door to needle times. Yeah. And that's kind of that's one of the things that right now is acutely driving our decision is if you will not give us a reliable door to needle time, I can't trust that you're going to. And I I don't mean this offensively, but just practically, if you can't give me reliable data for which to base my decisions off of, I'm going to go with the next best, which is skip that facility, drive an extra 20 to 30 minutes down the road where we know this is going to work. We know your metrics. We know your 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 more capable facility. So the trade-off seems to be better versus am I putting this patient at risk? And it, it's it's not to that they're bad providers. It's that the more you do something, the better you get at it. I don't know how experienced with this huge push some of these providers are for a lot of the reasons we've already mentioned. Like, it, does this drug even work? Is it safe? You have all this conflicting information. So it can be kind of difficult for those systems of care to be mobilized in smaller hospitals versus the larger ones where the initiatives originate from. Because this isn't Baptist First Rodeo. You guys have been a participating site for years, with, especially with the thrombectomy stuff. That's kind of where we see on our end of the ambulance bay the, the difference. And it's it's notable. You know, some days you go in and they're really quick on it and they, they, get the do- they get the drug in quick. And some days it takes an hour or two. And it's like we could have been at X facility getting this patient to definitive care two or three times over by this point. And you, you feel bad. You, you almost... You almost feel like you've done this patient a disservice. Absolutely, that makes sense to me. And you know, I, I think, I think it, it's you know, you you touched on a lot of things there. I think it's it's really really hard for patients and paramedics and EMS providers to kind of know you know what kind of care they're getting, unless you know the physician or you know somebody on the inside or you've got some sort of you know previous uh, relationship. It's hard to know kind of who you're getting and who's taking care of you. Um, I think at Baptist, one of the things that has allowed us to be, you know, we were a, we were an enrollment center for Dawn. We were in Swift Prime. I think we had the fastest door to needle time for any uh, center. And 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 that again, not to not to brag. What is it now? Do you know your- our our average door to needle time? We're you know we're we're well under. Um, uh, I think our last for this year, we're under sixty minutes. And I mean, that's, that rivals the cardiac side of things. And that's where we're trying to get, you know, we want to, we want to get door to needle. And our, our, honestly, our issue is not really the, um, the model that was used at Baptist, which I haven't seen very many other places is our stroke center. Our stroke cath lab is run through the cardiac cath lab, not through radiology. Hmm. So our nurses and our radiology techs are used to STEMIs. Oh, that's cool. So they're used to just go, go, go. We got to get this thing going right now. So that's been our, that's why I was kind of like, I like your, you know, STEMI to stroke parallel because there are a lot of parallels there from, from our standpoint. Once we pick up the the bat phone and we start calling the team in, it is like so you're, it, you're, it's go time. You're piggybacking off another system of care. That's right. That was already put into place. Yeah. So what we did was, and, and again, 
Another reason that we were so successful, I think, is we we recognized early that we were going to get a lot more. It was going to be easier for us to drive a time dependent service line through the cath lab, the cardiac cath lab. And we had strong physician leadership that went to administration and said, this is what we want to do. And here's what we're going to do. And so we helped bring the, the emergency medicine providers on board. And so all of our ER docs down there now are like, oh, this is a stroke center. This is what we do. So a new doc comes in, you know, the nurses, there's a culture there where yeah. everybody says, this, Absolutely. This, this, is, this is what we do with stroke. We're, we're, we're aggressive with stroke here and we do, we do this stuff and, you know, there's, there's a workflow in place. So everybody knows the drill. And like you said, it's reps, you know? So at this point, we do, we do this so many times. I mean, I think I was on call um, uh, a couple weekends ago and screened, you know, something like 16 potential large vessel occlusions. And I mean, that's just that, that level of when you're doing it that many times, you know, you're going to get good at it. Yeah. I mean, facilities that see a high volume of patients, like, yeah, we don't want to like overload the mothership. But that's actually where the patient's going to get the best care because they see that volume. So to get to that point is you're absolutely right. So now I think that the challenge for us is going to be how do we help regional hospitals bring up their protocols to current evidence-based standards? Because not everybody's there. You guys know that. And the second is not everybody needs to be transferred to, you know, uh, a stroke center. If they don't have a large vessel occlusion and you're at a TPA capable hospital, there's not a whole lot more that Baptist is necessarily going to provide once they've received the standard level of care, whatever that is. And so mm -hmm. I think one opportunity moving forward, and this is something we're actively working on here at Baptist, is developing teleneurology, teleradiology, and telehealth to help provide time sensitive mission critical decision support about yes that patient can stay at your hospital and no that patient needs to be transferred here so is it a drip and ship is it appropriate to stay what do you do in a hospital where you have a patient who was given intravenous tpa but there's no neurosurgeon on staff there are you worried about an intracranial hemorrhage and conversion those sorts of things so it's complicated but there are a lot of decision support tools and a lot of technology infrastructure that can be adopted. And so that's what, that's what we're trying to do at Baptist now is how are we going to develop a stroke center so that when you take a patient to, uh, you know, uh, Baptist Corbin or you take them to, um, you know, Baptist East or, or any of the other Baptist affiliated hospitals, everybody should get the, the same level of care. They should get the same. You know, a treatment protocol. It's yeah. like it's like the Starbucks approach, right? Like you walk in, no matter where you go, you're going to get the same. You're going to get the same thing. So that that I think is really the frontier of, of stroke care at this point. It's not necessarily like oh, everybody just gets. Let's get everybody to a comprehensive stroke center because it's not. It's feasible, not feasible, right? It's it, and it's not it's not a good use of resources. And I know right now as and that's that's actually really good to know that that's being developed. And I look forward to watching that evolve. But right, like as things stand right now, it makes me. And I may be completely wrong, and I probably am. It makes me viscerally uncomfortable to take an LVO patient to a non-comprehensive center. Like in my tiny paramedic brain, it, I'm putting these two, you know, one plus one equals two. LVO stroke, probable thrombectomy to be candidate, probably is going to need some sort of intensive care. Screw everything else. We're driving to the comprehensive center. Like they can do everything there. There won't be any delay. There won't be any noise. They'll just be, it's streamlined. So, but with those other options in the armamentarium, I think that that would, that would change the paradigm a little bit as it stands right now. Because even at the hospitals that the community level hospitals that we take patients to, I don't really know of many physicians who, and I could empathize being in their shoes, who would be comfortable keeping a patient that has been given systemic TPA in their ER and sending them to the floor. As things stand right now, because a lot of them don't have that neurology support in place yet. I know one facility that does that, but uh, but then they just have to transfer them out if they develop ICH, which has ha I've seen happen recently. Um, and to diagnose a LVO, don't you need perfusion imaging? No, CTA at a minimum. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've okay. got you know so you've got you've got anatomical imaging, which is CT, MRI, CT angiogram, MRA. 
that just basically shows you what the anatomy is. Whether mm. there's, you know, can can you see the distal branches? Do okay. they pacify with the with the intravenous dye that you give? The physiological imaging gives you a little bit more information about kind of a more dynamic picture about how the blood is being delivered and so forth. So okay, you get a lot more. It, it's it's just it provides a slightly different kind of picture. So. The ideal scenario is to have both of those things together. So at our hospital, yeah, we we still call it the SWIFT Prime protocol. It's a SWIFT protocol, right? So, you know, uh, stroke patient comes in, they hit the door, they get basic labs, they go to the CT scanner. You rule out intracranial hemorrhage, brain tumor, hydrocephalus, any of the the structural stroke mm-hmm. mimics, right? Um, radiologist reviews that, and then uh, IV TPA if they're a candidate based on history at that point. Then we go on and we do our CT angiogram and CT perfusion, vascular imaging from the aortic arch all the way to the top of the head. And that, we just really like that too, because that gives me some idea about, you know, am I dealing with, we had a, you know, bilateral carotid occlusions that came in, you know, a couple months ago. Nice. Really? Yeah. So, you know, you want to know before you go in, you're like, I mean, <laughs> I'm about to get into some shit. So. <laughs> this is, this is, you better hang on. This is going to get wild. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have yeah. pictures of those clots? Oh, I've got, I got a bunch on my phone. Yeah, we, and we, we do it. We try and do a good job. We love sending those pictures back to you guys too. So we'll, you know, we'll take a picture of the clod and, you know. Send oh, that absolutely the, made my fucking day. Yeah. Because. Yeah. We do that as much as we can. We, it was really, I remember this, I, yeah, I'll, I'll remember this patient always vividly. Like it was, it was right at shift change and it had been a really rough shift. My partner and I were grumpy and it, it is, it, I hate to be this way, but occasionally you get to a point where you're just kind of grumpy. And you're like, this sick case is going to be total crap. And then you get there and you're like, there's something that's not right with you. And it was all really subtle stuff. It didn't sit down and scream, I'm having an LVO. It's like, you had some little bit of ataxic gait and just a little bit of aphasia that just, I can't really place. It looks pathologic. Some low, in, a low NIH, basically. Yeah. Was there gaze deviation? Uh, yes. I think because she, um, uh, she couldn't do the, uh, finger nose finger. Because isn't that a and there was a little bit of gaze factor in helping you determine if it's LVO looking for gaze deviation? Get, well, I mean, obviously, if you've got somebody that that's that's hemiplegic and gaze deviation and all that stuff, you're thinking, uh, you know, NIH stroke scale is going to be 22, and okay. they're going to definitely, yeah, they've had the but, face melter. Yeah, so when you, I like that face melter. But like, I think to get to your, what your question is for me, I think one of the things that can be a little bit more subtle is whether they have a neglect syndrome, and so that that's really they may not have gaze deviation, but like they won't look. <laughs> they won't look to the right because to them there is no right. right. So they they can move their eyes. It's not like they have a forced deviation because they've taken out their frontal eye fields and they just can't look anywhere over. So, you know, they they're looking at the clot. So if they're looking this way, their clot's on the left side. I like that's a really good teaching tool, looking at the clot. Yeah. And so and so uh uh that is um that's they may not have that level of it but you know if they it, that that's so if there's a parietal neglect syndrome or if they've got you know a motor drift which is a more cortical sign you know th- those those types of things really do kind of clue you in that you might be dealing with a more large vessel occlusion and so those are the things that they try and fold into these pre-hospital stroke uh, infield stroke uh, stroke scales yeah i'll always remember my partner at the time kind of being like, man, we've got to drive to Lexington. This is going to be three hours. And then getting some some of the, the de-identified like CTPA images and being like, oh, my God. And then finally getting another picture of this ridiculously long clot laid out next to a scalpel blade. And it's like, hey. Look at this. Like, yeah. That was in her brain. <laughs> like, the, that's the, so cool. The, th- the things that are nuts to me and the things that I can't get over is like that, you know, you, you pull out the the clot that's like the size of a pencil eraser or something. And the one that's just a little tiny clot that just got wedged in just the right place. And it goes into the distal left MCA, takes out their entire left hemisphere. And so they show up, you know, right sided, totally flaccid, globally aphasic, just all messed up take out the clot and you go see them a few that, you know, a few hours later and they're sitting up in bed and they're talking and they're using the right hand. It's like, that's awesome. That oh, yeah. is, we, we don't get those home runs all the time, but when you do, it's, it's pretty cool. I never forget the first thrombectomy I ever did outside of training. I was actually practicing in Dallas and I was at a hospital that was trying to get a comprehensive stroke center, but they weren't there yet. It was a, uh, it was like a 29 year old guy. And he was left-handed. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. He came in left-sided hemiplegic and couldn't oh. talk. And I and and I and I opened the clot device and I saw that the brain was reperfused. 
And like within 10 seconds, he lifts his left arm up off the table and he's like moving it around. And it, it was the most dramatic kind of instantaneous demonstration of the correlation between what the angiogram looked like and what the clinical outcome was. And it was, it was wild. So yeah, those, those kinds of, those kinds of things will keep you going for a long time. It's pretty neat. So brain responds differently. And I'm kind of confused. You can have a patient with stroke symptoms up to 24 hours, but I guess if you have a very small core infarct and good collateral perfusion, you, you just try to save uh, that collateral perfusion or keep it from getting worse. But it seems like you you reperfuse an area and they they completely respond to reperfusion. So can you have a patient how how does that core infarct respond to reperfusion? All right, here's the deal. So um, y- y'all obviously know about the idea time is brain, and the longer that the brain is deprived of blood flow, specifically oxygen, the longer the an area of the brain is deprived of oxygen, there's a curve, the time dependent curve that you can follow where that brain will die. All right. So then there's this idea of what we call the ischemic penumbra, and so this is an area of the brain that's subserved by the thrombosed artery where there's still collateral blood supply, usually coming from the surface of the brain, these tiny little peel collaterals, these little capillaries, they can supply blood in a retrograde fashion, sort of around the area of the clot. And they're supplying a very low amount of oxygen, very low amount of blood to that part of the brain. It is providing enough oxygen so that the neurons don't die but not enough oxygen where they can maintain okay. electrical activity. Yeah, they're kind of stunned. They're right. They're stunned. So the longer those uh, the longer those uh, neurons live in an oxygen poor environment, the li- higher the likelihood is that they're going to die. So the idea is we want to restore anterograde flow as quickly as possible so that we prevent those neurons in the salvageable ischemic penumbra from converting to core, you know, infarcted dead brain. Because once it's dead, it's dead, never coming back. That's comparable to, to some concepts in burn care too. And heart too, yeah. right? So, so you know, there's this idea that once the ATP gets out and, you know, I listened yeah. to your podcast about, you know, the different phases of cardio, cardiogenic <laughs> shock. It was like being back in medical school is great. <laughs> um, so, the problem is, is that the uh, degree of collateral or functional collateral flow is is highly, highly variable. And so some patients will have an occluded MCA and within, you know, uh, 30 minutes, their whole hemisphere is dead. There's nothing you can do about it. They show up there and you just, oh, you wow. look at the perfusion scan, you're like, man, this is, this, 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 this uh, brain is dead. Nothing to do. Some patients come in more than 24 hours out. They've been having symptoms for fluctuating TIAs for 36 hours and they've got a little tiny core and they've got great collateral circulation. And, you know, I would take those patients to the lab, even though their symptoms have been present for more than 24 hours because of what we saw on their imaging studies. Okay. The 24 hours that we uh, th- that's in sort of the new guidelines, that comes about as a result of two reasons. One is, is we've got to pick a number. We can't just say... Anybody with any stroke-like symptoms should be taken to a comprehensive stroke center regardless of time of onset because if they've been out for a week, yeah. you know, that's not that's not going to be helpful most of the right. time. So, that, so, to, so, to a certain extent, that's been a little bit of an arbitrary cutoff, but that happens to be the number that was used in DAWN, the most recent sort of wake-up stroke trial. That was the number that we were able to demonstrate benefit. Uh, so, and, and, you know, there's some people that are now, uh, offering what they call, um, what, what's the word they're using pa- uh, palliative thrombectomy. So even if you come in with a dead hemisphere, they're still going to do a thrombectomy because there's some data now showing that some of those patients are going to have a little bit of benefit. Wow. So that might huh. be, that might I didn't be, know that, that yeah, might I be, had no idea about that. That might be changing too. That's pretty, yeah. I, you know, I'm not convinced about that at all, but. That's a little you know, fringy. A year but ago, a year if ago. If I were a stroke patient, I might be like, yeah, let's, let's try it. Let's do it. Yeah. I, I, a year ago, I wouldn't have done a thrombectomy in an 83 year old with an NIH stroke scale of two, um, with an MCA occlusion. And now I would do it huh. seven days a week because of, because I've seen it, I've seen it go both ways. You know, I've seen wow. those patients go home a day later and I've seen them bone it in the ICU at two in the morning and, you know, die. So I, uh, I brought in a stroke, a wake up stroke patient to another facility, not yours. And I uh, called in a stroke alert and, uh, they didn't actually 
use their stroke protocol. And I was very pissed off. And they said, we don't do this for wake up strokes. And so I, I sent a lot of emails and talked to a lot of people and found out sure enough that they don't. And I'm like, are, are you kidding me? I mean, our, you know, I, I know for a fact, like when I'm on stroke call, there is always a flurry of, um, CT perfusions that come through at, you know, between five and 9 a.m. Yeah. Those are all the wake up strokes. <laughs> and there are a surprising number that are, you know, viable. So we, we take, we take, we take those patients to the lab aggressively, very aggressively. So let's, for, for our dear listeners, let's talk about the concept of a wake up stroke and then what the connotations of a wake up stroke have been in the past versus what they are now. So if you look at the guidelines for the initial systemic thrombolytic administration, you know, the NINS trial and everything that allowed TPA to get FDA approval for treatment of acute ischemic stroke in 94, I think is, is when that came about. Uh, they sort of are, they had to uh, try to balance the risk of causing intracranial hemorrhage. So if you give somebody that's had a large completed stroke, if you give them a big dose of thrombolytics, they're going to have a big hemorrhagic conversion because basically you've taken dead and farted brain and you can cause that to hemorrhage by giving intravenous TPA. So the idea was if you could give TPA very soon after the onset of a stroke, you would um, reduce the chances of causing intracranial hemorrhage. And so this idea of last known well became totally critical and central to guiding treatment decisions for stroke patients for, for decades. And so that's why this last known well comes into, comes into play. If you're, you know, more than four and a half hours out or three hours out, you're not a candidate for any sort of uh, systemic thrombolytic agent because the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is thought to be too high. That's where it has traditionally come into play. It also has come into play for initial thrombectomy trials that didn't use CT perfusion. They used, they sort of adopted the historical indications from intravenous TPA and they slow, they were trying to figure out, well, can we push that window out so a little bit? they slowly opened up that envelope. Yeah. So it more. went to three hours and four and a half, then six, then eight. Then we started to do thrombectomy with CT perfusion. The initial trials there used the same last known well, eight hours. Then they started to prove that CT perfusion was comparable and can give you the same type of information. Now we've got a trial, the Dawn trial saying, Last known well doesn't matter. If you've got favorable imaging profile on a perfusion scan, you should probably have a thrombectomy. So hopefully starting to move away from that. But that's kind of the that's kind of the story about how we got to where we are with the last known well. I heard from a another physician that their theory is that a patient wakes up because they're having a stroke. I've heard that theory too. I don't know if that there's a scientific basis for that or if it's like if if you see patients with wake up strokes coming in with perfusion scans that look like favorable, pretty new or not, or if since everybody infarcts differently, if there's any way to know, I mean, I don't know, how, I don't know the answer to that. But what what I can tell you is I had a patient uh, within the last month. This was a uh, young, healthy guy. He was in his fifties, and he came in. And he had a right MCA stroke. And he had a low, he was one of these guys that had a relatively low stroke scale. I think it was like, you know, like a six, but he had a, a CT perfusion that looked really bad. And so he was kind of an unusual stroke patient because he was awake and, and talking and kind of asking questions and looking around. It was a non-dominant hemisphere stroke. So language is intact. He just couldn't use his left arm was weak and, you know, that kind of stuff. But he was somebody I felt like if you let him go, he was going to progress to having a much worse problem. And so I'm in there doing his case and he's like, yeah, you know, I've got this, um, I got this headache and we're always taught that ischemic strokes don't cause headaches. That's not something you see that with intracranial hemorrhages or brain tumors or any of the other 600 causes of headaches that are not, <laughs> uh, you know, aneurysms or strokes. So he's like, yeah, I got this headache on the right side and I, I kind of didn't really give it a whole lot of credence. I'm like, this is, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm more focused on getting his clot out and so doing the work that I'm doing. And so I'm up there, I'm doing my thing and I'm like, okay, I'm going to deploy this device now. And that's the thing that we're going to use to grab the clot. And I know that that's painful. Like when you, when you deploy that thing in the artery inside the brain, it hurts. 
because uh, it stretches the blood mm-hmm. vessels. The brain, as you know, doesn't have pain receptors, mm-hmm. but the blood vessels do. And the meninges and the lining of the brain does. So the dura is very highly innervated. So are the arteries inside the brain too. Mm-hmm. So when I deployed this thing, he's like, oh, you know, oh, that hurts. And then, so I pull the clot out and get him revascularized. And he's like, when you deployed that device, that was the exact same pain that I had when I had my stroke. And so I'm like, okay, well, let's say that he did have AFib and he threw a clot and that clot kind of caused the artery to swell. It's possible that that gave that distension of the artery gave him, you know, the pain pain, and he was able to localize it. So if that's the case, then yeah, it makes sense to me that a stroke could wake you up because it hurts. That's That's fascinating. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Hopefully we'll figure that out. That's awesome. A lot of new, exciting things happening in the stroke area. Huh? So I look forward to seeing what happens. And if anyone has any of that sweet, sweet NIH money they want to throw our way to do some research as to where we should take stroke patients. Man, the, ne- the next thing the next thing is going to be like, um, there's a couple of software packages out there where you can create like a little HIPAA compliant virtual messaging space with... The EMS providers, the stroke team, the nurses, and the yeah. ER providers. And so you basically would log on and you'd punch up your Baptist group and everybody who was on call would get looped into the thing. And you'd be like, hey, guys, we're en route. Uh, I've got you know suspected LVO. We're seven minutes out. And the ER doc says, okay, man, we're ready for yeah. you. Just bring them right to the scanner. And the stroke doc's like, hey, we're, you know, we're on standby. And then, you know... 90 minutes later, hopefully you get a text back showing, hey, here's a clot we pulled out and this is what her perfusion scan looks like. That and would be pretty sweet. I've seen yeah, that. Yeah. It's, it's just very expensive. And if you guys want to buy that for us, we'd be more than happy to use it. <laughs> that's the plan. No, we, we no, the EMS doesn't pay for it. I mean, the hospital yeah. does. And so, you know, I think that there's uh, there's there's a stroke system in St. Elizabeth, Cin- Cincinnati. Yeah. Yeah. There, I think it's called JOIN. Hmm. Uh, not to not to sort of I don't have any financial stake in that particular company. I but wish I did. It's one that we looked at, and so that that's probably coming. And then by an extension to you know the other the other thought is you know if we can get regional emergency rooms in on the same thing, we can help them make the yeah. decisions about what to do. So. I think that's a big part of what causes the delay in emergency rooms is making the decision to administer thrombolytics, and I th- I also think. And I could be wrong, but what if the patient doesn't want it? And somebody's got to have that conversation with the patient. And I think it's it can be a tough conversation to have. And it's oh, yeah. hard to explain the the potential for uh, benefit, but also the, the potential for harm, the modest risk of harm. And do you have a lot of patients who don't or who choose not to get all to place? No. Really? No. Uh-uh. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I did my residency training in San Diego, fellowship in Phoenix. I was in private practice in Dallas for three years before I moved up here. And one of the things I love about Kentucky is most of the time your patients are like, whatever you think, doc. <laughs> so, I mean, if you go in there and establish rapport and you talk to them and they feel like you're, you know, honest guy, straight shooter, they're going to be like, hey, man, if that's what you want to do. Then let's do it. I would say you probably scare them. I mean, just that's the goal. So yeah. you're, you're, you're very tall. You're very tall. Yeah. <laughs> You'd scare me and be like, whatever you say, just don't hurt me. <laughs> I, try, I try and get real close and kind of stand <laughs> over to intimidation. Right? Just make it very clear that you lift. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's funny that you say that because I have gotten that feedback before. And so I'm actually the opposite. Like when I come in, I really make sure to like sit down and like give patients <laughs> space because I don't, I don't want to be that like, you know, domineering. It's just trying to make it a little bit more of like a, a conversation, you know, and I'm like, I'm pretty good at what I do. And I think I know what we should do here. And here's what I think we ought to do. And 99% of the time it's like, okay, let's do it. It's kind of, kind of whatever. Yeah. All right. So you mentioned, um, when we were conversing through email that you know a lot about pre-hospital stroke scales, there's tons of them. And what I'm gathering and Ryan and I talked about this earlier and we looked through some of the stuff, but Basically, whatever scale you're currently using, uh, whether it be the Cincinnati or Los Angeles, if they're high on that scale, there's a good chance that it's LVO. And that's kind of what people are doing. 
Yeah, I thought you were going to say no matter what scale you're using, it's wrong. Oh Cause no, because that, that's kind of that. That's kind of the like when you get into these conversations where people are like, "Well, no, A B C D is definitely the best, and here's why." No, 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 Cincinnati's better, and here's why. I think that a, a the best thing that an EMS provider, what a system can do, is agree on one and pick it and get really good at it, yeah, and get comfortable with it. Yeah, because it's got to be teachable. It's got to be reproducible. They're all, they all have their pluses and minuses. And so for me, from my perspective, pick one, get good at it, use it, understand its limitations, understand what it's good at and um, use that to kind of guide things. Because what you may find is especially an experienced EMS provider might do their Cincinnati score and, you know, they, they get it and they're like, well, you know, I still don't feel like I have a good understanding of what's going on here. You can start to add in and supplement things. I think it's a great idea. Everybody should know what the NIH stroke scale is and what it entails. Should an EMS provider be doing an NIH stroke scale in the field to make a triage decision? Probably not. It's just not it practical. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. flashcards involved. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's workbooks and all kinds of, you know. So, no. But, like, I think if you know what the NIH stroke scale is looking for yeah. and, and what each specific part of it means, and it, it'll, it'll just make you a better practitioner. But the fact that, again – just to go back to my original point, the fact that you guys are having this conversation now is a huge win because now it means, man, I'm not really sure what's going on with this guy, but you mentioned this sort of like idea of if you've been doing this long enough, you can look at somebody and say, man, something's not right with you. Just to, something doesn't fit here. You get that. Your, your like antenna starts to vibrate. They're I'm, really having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take yeah. this patient where they need to go. And uh, I would love to be able to get them to. Baptist, but that's 90 minutes away. So I'm going to take them to my regional ER and have them do a head CT and start some TPA. And, you know, maybe it's going to be a fly in drip and shift or something like that. And that's, that's where the concept of having a little bit more than the uh, Cincinnati pre hospital knowledge of a neuro exam comes into play. One of, one of the, the gentlemen that we've had on this podcast before, Chip Lang, has a really good episode directed towards EMS and ED providers about beefing up your neuro exam. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where I drew I, I a lot that. of the that that was the basis for a lot of the flags that were going off. It wasn't, yeah, you're technically Cincinnati negative, hey. but it doesn't take into advantage like the more subtle signs of posterior stroke. Because I honestly thought they were having a posterior stroke based on their symptoms, but they ended up having an LVO. It was just very early on in the infarct course. Yeah, or they or they had great collaterals, or it was a non occlusive thrombus, or any of those little things. But yeah, I mean. Most people probably aren't going to pick that up, but and it's good being able to speak that language when I walk in and I'm talking to an ER doc or one of the neurologists that come down and be like, I know I'm going to mispronounce this and get a lot of these concepts wrong, but yeah, they have neglect or they have this type of gaze deviation or you know they have they can't two point discriminate on this side, and just being able that I feel like that clears things up a lot more. Yeah, and well, and, it and, can and, also hurt as much because I get for everything that I get wrong, I mispronounce something or confuse a concept. But yeah, we, uh, we won't ding you for that. But I mean, I guarantee you, if you got a, a paramedic that comes in talking about neglect, I mean, everybody's going to be like, oh, okay, let's, let's get, this 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 guy knows what's going on. Let's 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 get things moving. It's great. Since we gave Chip a plug, he has to give us one now. That's how the source Chip. <laughs> if you listen, um, so stroke scales aside. Clinically, if you're looking at a patient, the lower threshold, what signs and symptoms would um, have light bulbs going off in your head saying that there's a good chance this patient is having a large vessel occlusion? Yeah, for me, again, I that that's a tough one to answer because um, – you know, you, you guys are familiar with the concept of a funnel effect, right? So, mm -hmm. the, the stroke patients that I see as an interventional neurosurgeon. Okay. I've already been screened. Those are, those are, are, definitely those are stroke. stroke patients, man. Those are like, you know, you've got something going on. So, it's hard for me to say like, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm particularly sensitive, I think, to uh, speech and paraphasic errors. And so, people that have like a non-fluent speech production or they've got repetition impairment or naming or something like that. So a lot of the dominant hemisphere stuff, I, I pick up on that. Um, people that have neglect, I mean, I've definitely like walked into hospital beds and been standing off to one side and you're like, this person's not 
getting the whole picture here and you walk around to the other side and it's like you're talking to a totally different person. Uh -huh. You're like, man, something's going on here. This isn't right. But, you know, again, as a neurosurgeon, for me, that's also like maybe that person has a brain tumor. You know, maybe they, maybe mm -hmm. they've got some weird, um, you know, parietal uh, Gertzmann syndrome or something <laughs> like that. So, it, so it's, it's, it's different for me. But I think when I'm, when I'm out talking, you know, so I, I do some EMS outreach. Um, mostly that's kind of helping with stroke triage and thrombectomy and stuff like that. But then when you go and talk to sort of non-professional first responders – my whole thing is I, I just go back to the FAST acronym. And I think it's a great way for people to just yeah. kind of get the basics of it. I think so. it's great for non-professional first responders exactly. and lay people. Right, exactly. And, I, you know, in an ideal world, we could build and validate a super sensitive, super specific screening tool for LVO for EMS providers. But – like you said, there's one, there's, there's a stroke scale for every single flavor of the day. Right. So cortical signs to me are, you know, facial droop, drift, weakness, um, you know, numbness, things like that. Then you've got more of the neglect syndromes. Uh, you've got gaze deviation. And again, trying to differentiate between what truly is like a forced eye deviation. That's usually, that's usually like a hemispheric stroke syndrome. That patient's going to be kind of messed up no matter what, right? Can you explain that forced eye syndrome? So that's like, that's the patient with the MCA occlusion and they've got, you know, uh, totally aphasic, can't speak, can't understand, not following any commands, flaccid right upper extremity, flaccid left lower extremity, and their eyes are deviated to the, uh, to the to the left. And that's a sign of MCA occlusion. That's a, that's a sign of a left MCA occlusion. And Are, is that the most common um, large vessel that you extract clots from? Or? You is, mentioned MCA a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that that's the that is the one that is um, uh, most easily recognizable because okay. if you have like an anterior cerebral artery uh, stroke that might give you some leg weakness. And then you're like, God, is this patient of lumbar stenosis or, you know, it could, that can be a little bit more subtle. The posterior circulation stuff that's all over the map. Cause that's like diplopia yeah. and you know, you're, you know, those you get little, all sorts of weirdness. Yeah. yeah. All kinds of weirdness. So, so the MCA is one just because it's a large vessel and tends to be pretty common. So we see ICA occlusions and MCA occlusions. Those are the ones we see most commonly. I'd like to eventually be able to correlate the patient's symptoms with the anatomical location of the infarct, kind of like we can with uh, stimming. I think we'll- it's a lot easier with <laughs> EKGs. <laughs> it's so much easier to locate a lesion on an EKG than it is with a clinical sign, at least for me, of like clinical signs and symptoms to different lesions in the brain. Have you I'm guys? Sure it's easy for you because you're a neurosurgeon. But... You'd be surprised. I mean, just just uh, that's, it's all just you know reps. But man, it's just like what was that? You had that William Osler quote in your last podcast about you know every patient is different. Oh yeah. So oh, it's, yeah. It, it's just you know there are some things, there are some commonalities, and some some things that you see over and over again. But every day, it's just like man, that's just a little bit different. I was going to ask so you if you guys founders have, have you seen the like uh, the helmets that they're putting on stroke patients now that are supposed to be helping to diagnose uh, large vessel occlusions? No. Is that like a Harry Potter sorting hat for everybody? Exactly. Exactly. Like one day we won't even need one. We'll just have this shitty old House raggedy of Baptist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this this little raggedy hat we put on someone's like yes, they're That's having right. an MCA occlusion right now. You need to take them to a real hospital. That's right. Yeah. No, they're, they're, yeah, but uh, yeah, this idea that like we can start doing uh more the the EKG for stroke. That's kind of the the gold standard. I'm really looking forward to an era where we have a non-invasive way to just kind of enhance our clinical picture with these patients. Yeah. Like what enzyme does the brain release when it gets damaged and will we be able to measure that? The, so I I did a I did a literature search before I came over here to try and see if there and there and there's a couple of like totally unpronounceable, you know, <laughs> CK1917 <laughs> all, all these like sort of acronyms and so there are peptides that th they have detected you know, in the serum peripherally that are correlated with brain ischemia. Uh, the problem is, is that it's, you know, you've got the blood brain barrier. So if you're trying to diagnose acute stroke, that's a very different thing than looking at infarcted brain where the blood brain barrier has broken down and then all of the like brain natriuretic peptide has leaked out. It's just and, chilling out in the systemic circulation. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, so BNP is, is, is one that's produced by the brain. It's elevated. Uh, you know, it, they're looking at it for traumatic brain injury too. It's the same type of thing. So, the problem is, is you got to identify these peptides which can leak out and that are clinically significant. And then how do you develop an assay that you can use in like a point of care type of a scenario. So, 
the academics are working on it. They're, <laughs> they're, you know, they say they're five years away from having, uh, any sort of clinically useful, um, tool like that. That answer was also a really prolonged way of me of basically saying that I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> any of the stuff that I had to know for, you know, boards. So I think we've hit most of our, our main points. I have, I have one more question. When it comes to treating the blood pressure, I know everyone talks about this and everyone really wants to know. Um, it's the only time that we would really need to treat the blood pressure is if, if we think that they're a TPA candidate and we want the hospital to be able to give TPA sooner, we kind of be treating the blood pressure so, so that it's low enough for them to get uh, all to place. Yeah. So, and, and as you guys probably know, the guidelines for blood pressure control for TPA were revised last year. Or maybe you didn't, I don't know, the, 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 but it, for certainly from the emergency physician, there used to be this hard cutoff where if you couldn't get their stock blood pressure less than 200, you couldn't give TPA. It was this absolute contraindication. That's been relaxed a little bit. It's relative contraindication if you're actively treating it and so forth. Um, I think the blood pressure question is sort of an interesting one because, um, you know, you, you certainly don't want to bottom them out if they've got, yeah. uh, if they've got a non-occlusive thrombus or if they've got sort of tenuous collateral supply and they're reliant on a certain amount of systolic, you know, systemic hypertension to provide that perfusion. You don't want to give them a bunch of, um, uh, uh, vasodilatory agents that are going to impair their ability to do that. So yeah, I think if they, you know, if their blood pressure is two fifty and you know, so stock at two fifty and you're and you're on the way, I think it's fine. To, give them some little beta wall. Or yeah, just give yeah. them something. But like, you know, what, what the guidelines? What two twenty? I think now or two hundred yeah, for. It's been for, expanded up. Yeah, so you know, if you want to get them into that range to get IVTPA, that's great. Personally, a little bit of you know, I tolerate a little bit of permissive hypertension in the setting of an acute stroke for that very for that very reason, just because I'm I'm more worried about uh, per, you know, supporting collateral blood supply. Now, what agent would you prefer to use? Because almost every ambulance in America is going to have nitro on it, but nitro in all of its various forms is probably not the best agent to be using for control of neurologically like impactful hypertension. Well, we want to decrease afterload. Yeah. So I use we use Cardine. Uh, okay. so, the, so the calcium channel blockers are really popular. I've got no problem with beta blockers. I think that's that's probably fine. Because that, that, that's a common question I've been asked: is well, we have a we have a vasodilating agent on the truck. Why don't we just hang IV nitro? But nitro well, sucks for uh, yes, yeah. and because it's it doesn't reduce afterload like yeah. we need it to do. Unless yeah. you give like a huge high dose. Yeah, we give a milligram of it, and yeah, yeah it'll work. Yeah, so. no, don't do that. <laughs> um, no, but so so yeah. If, if your only choice is nitro, then just wait till you get to the ER. If you've got any of the other stuff, um, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, that's what we, that's what we use. Because as I understand it, your calcium channel blockers are pretty much your go to. Yeah, like cardium and then like hydrolazine or something. Of yeah, that, of yeah, that those those are the best because because the you know as you know the thing with the beta blockers is is if they've got some sort of underlying cardiac issue and you put them into a, 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 a rhythm uh, yeah radio rhythm yeah exactly um then then you've really it's hard to rescue from you've really fixed their blood pressure problem in forever a, yeah. in some cases that's right other housekeeping things with stroke elevate the head of the bed a little bit um don't bring in a hypoglycemic patient that's right uh, oh yeah that's a not a good look. That's, that's that's a party foul what's blood sugar oh 30, 30. great <laughs> thanks guys um, yeah, no, that's, that's, um, the elevating the head of the bread. Uh, sure. I don't, again, I think that it, it, again, it's different for you guys. Cause you really don't, even when you think, you know, you don't know, right. So you, you could be dealing with an intracranial hemorrhage. You could be dealing with, you know, some other, you know, subdural, there's lots of things that could be stroke mimics, which are going to really change once we have a, once we have a diagnosis. So, yeah. um, that's that's that, that that's a little tougher to give general rules, I think. And I've always done the the head to bed elevation when I suspected neurotrauma. Yeah, that was that was more the mm -hmm. the ischemic stroke. I can see where it have a benefit. But that's where I've always seen it like published the most is something that you should do is elevate the head of the bed thirty degrees for you know like a TBI that's hypertensive. Or yeah. And that's and that, present Cushing's reflex or something of that nature. And that's really more for uh, to prevent venous engorgement. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I w I want to just. Put this out there so that all of our listeners know how we deal with uh, stroke patients or how we triage them. Um, we are more than 20 minutes or our comprehensive stroke center is more than 20 minutes away from our uh, local hospital. And um, we do 
bypass that. Our medical director wants us to. We looked at the numbers. We've been to stroke meetings with our local hospital. And, um, you know, we're fine with lighting the fire under them, you know, keep sending us data. But until you can get those um, your door to needle times down a little bit, we can be at a comprehensive center and still get um, get thrombolytics on board sooner than they can if we were to take them to our closest hospital. And then we also cut our time uh, for thrombectomy if they're a candidate. And that's a medical director directive, and that's what he wants us to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. for me, 20 minutes to bypass a primary stroke center or a regional community hospital to get to a comprehensive stroke center, that's, that's, that's you know, a no-brainer. <laughs> that, that's a – absolutely. That there's, there's very good evidence, and I think that even under the current KBMS uh, guidelines, we would absolutely support um, that, that decision for sure. With the, the recent stroke – uh, guidelines came out and they they gave an EMS recommendation, but they've redacted that since then. And that was like the first time they've ever done it. And they yep. did it just like that. Yeah, they, they got a lot. 13 they got, redactions in under a month. They got a lot of pushback from that and they're going to have to go back and, and fix that. And I think a lot of it was there were there were some conflicting data. It, it wasn't ready to be released. I think they just kind of got a little bit ahead of themselves, my personal opinion. So um, I actually have a picture of it before they redacted it, but <laughs> that's great. That's great. Like you grab like the Twitter screenshot before they deleted the tweet. Yeah. yeah that's yep. great. Good. No, Gotta that's have the evidence. Gotta it, have it, the evidence. It's, 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 it's in flux. It's in evolution. It's hotly debated amongst the people who are kind of helping to guide these policy decisions and it is a really shifting and evolving landscape. And a year from now, it's going to look totally different than it does right now. So I don't, know, I don't know what to tell you other than, you know, just hang on and, and you know, yeah, try, try and keep hang up. Hang on and try to do the best thing for your patients. Yeah. <sighs> and that's what we're worried about. I mean, we don't want to make any enemies, but we we, we our patients come first uh, above all else. And that's what we're always going to – that's all, what we're always going to do. So – Ron, do you have any other questions for Dr. Newman? No, I'd like to try and uh, – so we've talked for a good long while here, but if we could try and form all of this into a usable summary for our listeners' next shift. So they have a stroke patient. You're 30 minutes away from a comprehensive stroke center. What are we doing? I still don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Uh, It depends. I think that's a conversation that you should have with your local hospitals and with your medical director. Ask your hospitals for the data. Don't settle for, uh, well, just bring us, bring them here and we'll, we'll give lytics. I mean, have a down and dirty conversation with them because, I mean, the patient's life and their brain is on the line. It's going to be an uncomfortable conversation for, for, for someone at that hospital. Yeah, and these, some of them don't like to come up off, up off that data. I think this is complicated, and the patients are a little complicated. And we we try to make it simple is good, but I think we're making it more simpler than it should be. Um, and I'm I'm still not I'm still afraid. It, so here's what I'm going to do: if I have a patient where I'm like, eh, it might be a stroke. I'm not sure if it's a stroke or not. I'll probably take them locally, right? Because there's a really good chance that it's not an LVO, but if if it's a patient that um, I'm like this this dude's having a stroke, like this yeah. is a strokey stroke, then we're, then we're going to a thrombectomy center because one that's what our medical director wants to do, and we've we've um, we've talked to our local hospital, so we transferred to and we looked at their times, and we, that's what we have we feel is best for the patient. That's a good takeaway. Yeah, thirty minutes. That's a tough. I think, you know, I know you picked that number on purpose, but that's like, <laughs> man, that is right at the breaking point because certainly any less than that you go and any more than that you don't. The only thing I would add to that is just to keep in mind that this idea of last known well is an important piece of clinical information, but don't let it guide your decision making because for two reasons. One is, is centers that have physiological imaging don't care as much about last known well and B, that is is that's like the classic, you know, p- you know patient hits the ER, uh, they went to bed last night at nine o'clock, they show up at 7 a.m. Oh, and the last known well is nine o'clock. ER doc <laughs> says, oh, it's last known well is nine o'clock. And then, you know, half an hour later, the daughter shows up. He's like, oh, no, I heard him get up and go to the bathroom yeah. at three in the morning. You're just like, oh, okay, everything's like, you know, totally, there, gets, totally gets reset at that point. And I, I cannot tell you how many times we have had 
to fight, basically do like a, to some CSI level shit to try and figure <laughs> out from the family and the patient what yeah. their actual last known well was. Yeah. And I've gotten a lot of flack in the CT scan. Like, why don't you know approximately? Like, I had to put my Horatio hat on and walk around here and try to do some like the extended calculus based on three different reports as to where, what his last known well was. So it's it's comforting for me to know, at least on a practical note, that it's not necessarily being completely denigrated, but it's being put down a little bit in, in the order of importance. Like still good to know, but we're not living and dying by the last known well metric anymore. Yeah, well, and I got to embarrassingly for me, I was I lived in Kentucky for over a year uh, before I realized that there were two time zones in the state. And so the last <laughs> known well in Western Kentucky is, you know, could potentially a very different thing. And so that, that happened. We got, we didn't get burned, fortunately. I think if I remember correctly in that circumstance, it actually worked in our favor, but the last known well suddenly shifted by an hour when somebody said, wait, what hospital did they come from? So and that's and, something people should know too, if they're not a lytic candidate. I mean, keep the damn like lytic checklist handy and use it. And if the patient is not a candidate, then they might still be a candidate for thrombectomy. So that's still usable information for someone along the line. And I think it, I, I think even, like you said, even if they're not a lytic candidate, I think it would be helpful to have that to pass on to the doc at the CT scanner. And that could help our decision making because if they're not a lytic cl- candidate, then that that's an easy, our destination decision is becomes easy at that point, right? Yeah. Because they could still be a candidate for thrombectomy. Absolutely. So there's no need to even discuss if we should stop at the local center or not. Within reason, if the patient's stable. Yeah. Dr. Newman, do you have anything to add? No. Only the only thing I was going to add is, um, you know, uh, no debate on our side of it about uh, lytics, about thrombectomy. Um, I care a lot less about the patient's age than I do about their baseline functional status. So okay. a 60 year old that lives in a nursing home and it's got end stage Alzheimer's is not going to get a thrombectomy, but a 93 year old who's out mowing their lawn probably is. And so th- that, that stuff is being borne out in our data as well. So don't let the, it really age matters a lot less than functional status and, and uh, dementia status. So if you can provide those pieces of information too, that's really helpful for us. That sometimes that's a lot harder for you guys, but you know, um, those are, those are things that are really, uh, uh, matter and uh, yeah, it's it's exciting, man. It's changing a lot. Like I always like to say, stroke care now is where cardiology care was, you know, 15 years ago. Yes, we we can do angioplasty, we can do stenting, we can do you know all. This I'm sure stuff, you guys so. don't catch any flack at all from cardiologists about this. Oh, we're catching up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Newman, thank you so much. Yes, for thank you. It's been excellent. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and uh, I think for our listeners, if they have any questions that we can answer, we'll shoot you an email. Yeah, that sounds fun. We'll shoot Dr. Newman an email and we'll get back to you with his response because I don't know that you have like any public pages on social media or anything like that. Yeah, I got off the I got off the social media thing uh, when I, you know. I didn't want to see my, my kids. I was always on my phone. I didn't want my face to be buried in my phone with my kids. And, and I just haven't, from from my professional standpoint, it hasn't really been something I needed. But I'm ha- I'm be happy to answer questions and emails. And, um, you know, if there's outreach opportunities for any of the local EMS stuff, we we have um, – we have a lot of industry sponsors and they'll, they'll pay for us to, you know, come out and give talks and we can do education. And it's something that we're absolutely, I, personally, it's something I'm very interested in. So we we would love to help facilitate some of that. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, maybe if a new uh, groundbreaking study comes out regarding strokes, we can have Dr. Newman back on to discuss. It. There's so a few that. in the pipeline <laughs> for sure. All right. Sounds good. So if you guys have any questions, email us uh, curbedabed at gmail.com or find us on Facebook uh, or Twitter. Our handle is at curbedabed. Bye.